Welcome. This video will focus on academic writing at the university level. Although not necessarily applicable to all fields, the same general processes that will be discussed may be transferred over into other forms of writing as well. Our journey will unfold in three parts. First, we will discuss what is scholarly writing. Second, we will explore how to write effectively, both in quality and in minimizing the amount of time spent on assignments. Finally, we will focus in on specific resources available to Concordia students. If you are not a member of Concordia, your university also has similar resources available. To begin, what do we mean by scholarly writing? It is a task of double critical attention, questioning, reflecting, and judging. Double critical means that you are meant to pay attention to, question, reflect upon, and judge. Not only the object of study, which is the data you will be collecting or the topic you are writing on, but also to pay attention to yourself as a scholar and writer. Specifically in terms of what are your preconceptions? Are there any biases? What is your desire in writing the piece? And what are your interests? Specifically how these four items may affect both your reading of the data and your writing. The goal of an academic reflection paper is to be substantial and to communicate and therefore will be grounded in solid research data, a clearly presented and interpreted experience, demonstrate intelligent reasoning, and justify judgment. Therefore, you are being asked to carry with you the authority of authenticity, which simply means that you have paid attention, you have questioned, you have reflected upon, and you have thought about not only the data, but your own involvement with the data. Contrastingly, what this also means is that scholarly writing is not unreflective, unorganized. It is not a stream of conscious or a diary entry. In scholarly writing, you should avoid all colloquialisms, cliches, platitudes, or jargon. You will not present mere opinion, a string of antidotes, or statements which are unsupported by data and reasoning. In scholarly writing, you are encouraged to back up your insights, ideas, and statements with description, explanation, reflection, and your own conclusions. Simply put, scholarly writing is not a form of social media. It is not a Facebook or a Twitter post. How you avoid writing the social media type assignment is to beware of huge or universal statements. These risk to be ungrounded generalizations. Phrases to avoid include everyone thinks, it is said, everyone always, if you do have to use any of these phrases or similar ones, be sure to back it up using data from the topic at hand or by sourcing. Another phrase you will want to avoid is in my opinion. The reason to avoid this is that often people will hide behind my opinion and not back it up. Therefore, your opinion is of no scholarly interest. That is not to say that you do not have valuable insights that should be communicated to the reader. Rather, if you have done your research and have engaged in your scholarship as authentically as possible, you have earned the right to speak as an authoritative scholar on the subject. And therefore, the phrase, in my opinion, is very rarely needed, as you will have the data to back yourself up. Similarly, it is important to be mindful of how you use faith statements. Like other forms of personal experience, these may be relevant, but need to likewise be grounded. Your goal is always to help the reader understand why specifically you hold the beliefs that you do. Whenever using a faith statement, be sure to engage it critically. This is very important 
when doing work in theological studies or other humanities, as you will be bringing yourself into conversation with the text. Finally, try to avoid using generalizations and abstractions. Read and use your texts carefully, use concrete examples, and clear logical explanation. Again, this ties into the idea that you are bringing your reader on a journey with you, and you want this to be as clear, concise, and useful to them as possible. As mentioned previously, in academic writing, you will have to use quotes. You should use these with discretion, specifically as a launching point to support your statements. Longer quotes should be single-spaced and indented. Remember as well that if you are doing a shorter assignment, you should not be using long quotes, as it will eat up the amount of space that you have to express your own insights. And don't forget to always cite. These citations should occur either when quoting directly or even when alluding to the ideas of another author. Now that we have an idea of what academic writing is, let us turn to how exactly to engage in this practice. Whenever you are writing, in any format, the first thing that you should sit down and understand is what exactly does your reader want. This reader can be a teacher, it can be an editor, it can be just a general reader. Without knowing what it is that they expect and what it is that they require, none of the other steps can be done. Step two is to collect your data. This step involves specifically pulling out what quotes, what insights of the author, and what insights of your own you will be using in order to answer the question or present your research findings. The next step is planning. This is always useful and counterintuitively will decrease the amount of time that you spend writing any given work. Step 4 is the writing itself. Step 5 is polishing the work or editing, rewriting. And step 6 is the final presentation to a teacher, an academic journal, an editor, etc. We will now turn to look at each of these steps individually and go a little bit more in depth. The first step, as mentioned, is what do they want? What does your potential reader want and need from your work? In an academic setting, what is useful is to break down what is being asked. We have here an example from a Theological Studies course. Just a quick disclaimer, I have never taken the course in which this question appears, nor do I have any knowledge of the theories of which it speaks. This question will simply act as an example of how one can go about breaking down what is expected even if you do not have any idea of the subject matter that you will be researching. This question reads, Longhurst, course pack item number 10, claims that all art, whether its subject matter is religious or not, is inherently theological in its aesthetic modality. Present and explain your understanding of what he means by this, including what he means by aesthetic modality. Relate some other ideas you have encountered in the course, from course pack, lectures, class discussions, to Longhurst's claim. Bring your own critical insights into the conversation. A careful reading of course pack material, especially Longhurst, is essential to this assignment. This question provides a very good example as the professor who gave it spells out exactly what is wanted within the essay. First, the professor is asking to present and explain your understanding of what he, Longhurst, means by aesthetic modality. 
Second, the student is being asked to relate some other ideas encountered in the course to this claim. In this instance, the professor has also indicated exactly how you are to go about that. You are to bring in your own critical insights and to engage in a careful reading of course material. Now that we have some idea of what exactly is expected, we can go about collecting our data. Within this step, what is important is to write down what you want to reference for the piece and what you would like to talk about. Now this can be done in both an organized or a disorganized manner. We are not at the stage of physically writing any of the texts, merely of gathering the information. How you can do this is to just put simple phrases into a word cloud or to use cue cards with individual thoughts on each or simply to make a list. Again, what is important is just to put down all of the information, your initial insights, anything that you will later cite. Also, if possible, be sure to write down exactly where you're getting information if you are taking the author's insights, as this will cut down the amount of time you spend in later steps. Finally, if you are more auditory than visual, you may also consider recording your insights. So again, within the current example, you would want to focus in on two specific aspects of that question. First, you would want to collect the data on what is meant by aesthetic modality. And second, you would want to write down other concepts that have been engaged within the course that have something to do with this initial concept. Once you have all of your data collected, or at least as much as you can think of at the time, you will want to move into the planning phase. What you will want to do in the planning phase is to order your thoughts into major points and write down the examples that will back up these insights. One way of doing this is to create a roadmap. You will start with a thesis. The thesis will indicate to the reader exactly what it is that you plan to be doing for the rest of your article. This can take many forms, but generally it will be one to two sentences in which you sum up the major points that you will be explaining later. And then, if you are doing this on a piece of paper or on a computer, you would just formulate a list. Therefore, major point one, the examples and quotes which relate to this point, point two, etc. Once you are used to this format of doing things, step three could be done simultaneously with step two. However, if you are beginning in an academic setting, it is advisable to keep these two steps separate until you are comfortable with them. Once you have your plan, it's time to move on to writing. There is nothing really important to say about this step, except you just have to do it. Often this is a step where people get stuck. What you need to remember is that it doesn't really matter what you write. And by this I mean that even if you write something that is horrendous and makes almost no sense, you can always fix this in the next step. What is important about step four is simply to have words on the page that you can work with. Therefore, the best tactic to have is quite simply to write. This can be done in multiple sessions or in a single session. And do not be concerned about the quality of your writing at this step as it is not what you will be handing in, because the format that you will be handing your writing in will be polished, which is the fifth step. Remember that no idea springs forth fully formed. It is advisable to take a few days off and then return to your work. Admittably, this is not always possible in an academic setting. However, this would be the ideal. A good way to edit grammar is to talk it out, specifically to read your text aloud to yourself 
you will often find that if you have grammatical issues, specifically run-on sentences or sentence fragments, your body will physically tell you that something is wrong, either because you require a breath or because the sentence seems to stop in mid-air and you will feel it in your body that you want to keep talking even though there is nothing left in that sentence. Another way to polish your work is to ask the help of a friend, family member, girlfriend, boyfriend, roommate, pretty much anyone. Just make sure that they do have some academic leanings, specifically that they are used to reading academic texts. These individuals do not have to be acquainted whatsoever with the topic which you are speaking. In fact, it's even better if they do not know, because they will be able to come back to you and point out where you have logical gaps. Of course, when this version of editing returns to you, you may then judge what should be changed and what should remain the same. If you are writing a theological text and allude to the Imago Dei, your friend may not know what this is and indicate it to you. However, you may not need to actually define the term for a theological studies course. So again, use your judgment, but beware that through this specific type of editing, you will have to learn how to take criticism. It doesn't matter who you are, the first time that one of your close friends edits something that you have written and sends it back to you, your ego will take a little bit of a hit. This is completely normal. The important thing is to learn how to take that criticism, judge it, and then change your work for the better. Once you are done polishing your work, it is then time to present the final result. And remember that the only way that you will get better at writing is to write continuously. Two of the most worthwhile courses that I took in my undergraduate career were courses in which I had to submit responses every week. Needless to say, this was very difficult. However, it did get easier as time went on. I'm not necessarily advocating that you seek out courses like this, but if you are already in a situation that you have the opportunity to write continuously, I would suggest you take it. Specifically, if you're on a committee which requires minutes to be taken, or an organization which is currently doing promotional material, or if you have a school newspaper which you could contribute to from time to time. Like any other skill, writing is something that you have to work on to get better at. If you're a student at Concordia, there are many resources available to you to strengthen your writing. Of course, no video on writing would be complete without a warning against plagiarism. Basically, don't do it. If you are unsure what plagiarism means, there is a link in the description below that you can follow for a full description. Similarly, there is a link on how to cite sources within any given citation style, a link for library workshops, and also one for general research help. Here you'll find information on how to start researching, as well as the ability to ask a librarian. Finally, Concordia students have access to the Student Learning Center, which offers free individual writing assistance. This service emphasizes on the development of writing skills. An example of a typical session may include brainstorming, outlining, developing arguments, organizing ideas, and improving grammar. But please note that writing assistants do not proofread or edit papers, but they will help you to get the tools to do it yourself. For more information and to make an appointment, you can visit the link down below. That's all for this video, and I'll see you next time.